Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm Ned Sullivan, president of Cena Hudson and with other colleagues uh, on the Zoom today, a, a founder of the Northeast Carbon Alliance. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, uh, the Northeast Carbon Alliance or NECA brings together farmers, land managers, scientists and public policy experts to advance the great power of natural solutions to combat climate change. And we do that from mountaintop to ocean floor in the Hudson Valley, uh, New York State, the Northeastern states in particularly, and nationally. Uh, we seek to elevate and amplify the work of our partners, sharing information about management practices that are most effective to achieve our collective uh, goals uh, in terms of climate uh, and biodiversity as we are doing today. Uh, just a quick update on good things that have happened uh, over the past year uh, through NECA efforts in collaboration with, with partners. Uh, first, New York State passed soil health legislation uh, and a budget that significantly increased support for relevant programs. Uh, we filed comments on behalf of NECA and on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act scoping uh, document. And uh, our NECA policy committee is uh, working hard right now to plan for a, a federal farm bill listening session that is going to be held in uh, Ghent in the Hudson Valley um, on November 22nd. And we're going to be bringing together state agricultural leaders, congressional representatives, farmers, uh, and hopefully many of you from, uh, from uh, the Hudson Valley and northeastern states. Um, so we're, that's going to be co-hosted by uh, New York State Agriculture Commissioner uh, Ball and uh, the Commissioner of the State of Maine. So we've we've got uh, Northeastern State representation and their uh, invitations pending to many others. Uh, great thanks to Heather Eckert and Carly Fraccaroli for their help with today's program. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Pete Lopez, Cena Hudson's Executive Director for Policy Advocacy and Science, who is coordinating uh, Cena Hudson's role in NECA. And uh, I also wanna acknowledge and thank uh, Jessica Fowler in New York's DEC's uh, Office of Climate Change and Maureen Letty, Director of the Office of Climate Change in New York. Uh, before I present today's speaker, I will just make a public service announcement, encouraging those of you who are New York voters to Turn over your ballot on November 8th and vote yes on Proposition 1. Uh, this $4.2 billion environmental bond act initiative uh, includes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for investments that will help stem, stem climate change, including significant new state funding that will support uh, our soil health, uh, regenerative agriculture and soil, uh, initiatives and uh, environmental justice. So now I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, uh, Dallas McCann, who is the farm manager at White, Heart, White Feather Farm in Saugerties, New York. Dallas has been farming for over six years and believes that small farms, investment in communities and efficiency are keys to solving the crises that we face today and are seeking to address together. Uh, White Feather Farm is an innovative, small-scale operation which employs regenerative agriculture practices to improve soil health and enhance soil uh, sequestration of carbon. Uh, White Feather is also partnering with Roth Lumber and Saugerties to produce biochar, as you're about to hear. Uh, and I've had a tour, uh, Dallas has given me a, a tour of White Feather Farm and the uh, biochar operation nearby at uh, Roth Lumber. Uh, Dallas hails from Bakersfield, California, uh, home of the late Merle Haggard and other country legends. 
And the program will have two parts uh, and uh, it's scheduled for a total of an hour, but uh, Dallas is first gonna give you an overview of the farm and then we're gonna break for questions and discussions. And then um, he'll present about the biochar operation. And again, that'll be followed by questions and discussions. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dallas. Thank you very much, Ned, for that introduction. Uh, and I really appreciate the homage to Bakersfield and all the country stars that come out of there. It's just near and dear to my heart and proud of where I'm from. And uh, yeah, I've come a long way since Bakersfield, but here I am today. Never thought I'd be a farmer, but um, somehow made it here. Uh, I would like to introduce myself and say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the farm manager over here at White Feather Farm, as y'all know. I'm also co-owner of New York Carbon, a biochar uh, company that we just started a year ago. I've been farming for, as Ned said, about closer to seven years. Um, I've been messing around with biochar for a little over a year. I, currently, I'm interested in biochar because... I feel that the combination of biochar applications and small scale farming are extremely important catalysts to mitigating climate change and creating more resilient communities. Thank you, Tanika and Cena Hudson for this opportunity. I really appreciate you guys putting this together and putting all the work into it. Thank you to everybody who's here today. I see a lot of people who know a lot about biochar and uh, I really hope that that can help ignite the situation, the conversations and stem some ideas for everybody that's here. Um, I appreciate your time and I hope you leave today feeling excited and eager to explore the world of biochar and small scale farming and how the two worlds can come together. So with that, here we go. Uh, we'll start with the first slide. So I would like to just give an overview of our farm. This is a bird's eye view of the entire farm. The entirety is 66 acres, but this is sort of the main action of where everything happens. And if you look closely, you can see there's a lot of diversity in this picture. We have rolling hills, we have streams, we have ponds, we have dense forest woods, we have dead woods, we have uh, um, wetlands. Um, there's just a lot of things going on here. And I think it just represents uh, how much diversity that we are trying to sort of bring together and work with. Um, but as you see, you know, we have the pond, the production fields, we have rice paddies, uh, greenhouses, everything. So just take a close look and maybe this will kind of help you envision uh, what you're about to see moving forward. So next slide. So I'm gonna discuss our farm, uh, the landscape and our growing practices. This is just a, a side shot of uh, one of our fields. I'll take the next slide. So again, this is our, our landscape here. This is a bigger view of the property and there's even more here. Uh, the entirety of it is 66 acres. I'd say about 80% of that is dense forest woods and 5% uh, swampland and about 15% open arable land. Uh, again, we have all the waters, all the waterways everywhere. There's, um, there's, a, there's a floodplain there as well. We have to deal with that. And then uh, um, we also have an orchard and there's all kinds of fun stuff going on there. But uh, I also I need to recognize that we are tending Muncie and Lenape and Mohican land. Next slide, please. I'd like to point out as well that we are uh, very representative of our certifications here. Uh, the organic world has changed a lot over the course of the last 10 years, especially in the last five years. And we are a certified organic farm through NUFA New York, Northeast Organic Farming Association. And we are also Real Organic Project certified, uh, which is an add-on label to the NUFA certification. We're also certified naturally grown. The reason that I choose to represent all of these certifications, it's very important to me to start a conversation with everybody so that they understand the changing world of organics. It starts with federal standards, which is the NOFA New York, and then the add-on label of organic certification goes to Real Organic Project. The difference between 
Real Organic Project and NOFA New York is that Real Organic Project uh, has three main standards. One, that you're growing in soil, and two, that you're treating all of your livestock fairly and humanely, and three, that you are treating your staff uh, fairly as well. Those three standards are not required for federal NOFA New York certifications. We also choose to be certified naturally grown, which is a representation of peer-to-peer -peer certification processes. So we participate in all of these for these reasons, just to keep the conversation going and also to um, educate people about the ever-changing world of organic certification to help uh, ease confusion. A lot of consumers don't exactly know what it means to be certified organic. And so that's where these additional labels come into play, Real Organic Project as well. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to talk a little about what, about what we grow. Um, as you can see uh, from the previous slide that we have a, an on-site farm stand where we sell uh, everything that we grow and produce on the farm. So we're a, a small scale diversified farm. We grow over 80 varieties of fruits and vegetables. It can get a little crazy sometimes uh, learning how to grow all these things, but it's it's a fun process. And uh, the idea is, is that we offer a little bit of everything to our customers at Farm Stand through wholesale and to our donation outlets, uh, including flowers and everything else. Um, so we are growing, again, as I said, we're a diversified farm. Uh, we grow 60 pounds, roughly 60 pounds of rice annually each year. Each year, uh, One of the reasons why I decided to grow rice on our farm was because, again, this is leaning into the landscape here that we have. As I said, it's a very wet area, and we have very dense, silty soils on our property. So the silt retains a lot of water. It has a lot of water holding capacity, um, and the area is just so wet and there's a lot of groundwater. So we decided to use the hills that we have to dig into the hill, the, the hills and basically make terraced rice patties. And um, that's just an example again of, of the diversity here. We have a small orchard where we're growing everything from pawpaws, apples, pears, persimmons, peaches, plums. Um, that's a, it's a, quite an abundant uh, area. It's, it's not a production orchard, but it is there simply to, again, diversify our offerings. Uh, we also have chickens. I have 40 hilarious chickens that are always a good time and one good old rooster. And we also grow shiitake mushrooms uh, from logs. And all these pictures are pictures that we took of things that we have on our farm here. Um, and one thing I forgot too is uh, not only shiitake is we do wine cap mushroom production and also maple syrup production. So we're, we have a lot going on here, but uh, it's definitely a beautiful place for people to come and visit and learn things and learn about the possibilities of all that our landscape can offer us. So that's one of our goals. Next slide, please. So how we grow, uh, this is a picture here of one of our fields. And I, I wanna emphasize that we use uh, the market gardening techniques. It's uh, It's, a pretty common way for people to be farming these days, especially younger introduction farmers. Um, I think it's an important method and technique of growing because it is a way for more people to get into the business or the world of small scale farming. Market gardening allows people to produce a lot of food in very small places. And in terms of land access and capital costs and equipment access, it is, uh, it's very expensive and hard to get into for a lot of people. So we, I emphasize this point because I just, uh, it's becoming a lot more popular for people to do this. And it's just like opening up the world of small scale farms and allowing for more people to get into the, the business and into their communities. <clears throat> um, I can get the next slide, please. So, uh, we use a, a very, we use soil intensive practices here, uh, there's all kinds of terms. You can say no till, you can say minim minimal soil, minimal tillage or minimal soil disturbances. Um, you can, I just call it soil intensive. Uh, and that just means that we do not till our soils, but instead we use broad forks. We use 
uh, uh, basically we use broad forks for a lot of our soil um, to keep our soil healthy and keep air flowing deep. Um, we are a human scale farm, so I, we use mostly hand tools for our production. We have tractors on the farm, but we do not uh, use them for in our fields. We just use them to move material around mostly and tow things around. Uh, this is also a good way of allowing us to uh, pr produce the most amount of food in the smallest amount of spaces. Um, and it allows us to have a more intimate approach to uh, what we're growing. You know, I can walk the whole field in 20 minutes and uh, really take a close look at everything we're growing and be able to to be more on top of everything that we're doing. Um, and so again, this is one of the advantages of small scale growing. And also just for, since we are a nonprofit organization and we have a lot of foot traffic, I show people around a lot. And this is a much more uh, approachable way that people can see exactly what we're doing here and be able to digest it and be able to learn something and uh, translate it to the people uh, that they encounter as well. So it's a good way for us to kind of spread the word. Uh, next slide, please. So our soils, uh, the property is very silty soil. I think that's one of the hardest parts about my job is building the soil. Uh, it's again, as I said, very silty, uh, which is good and bad because I think it's, it's good because it's a great base to build more, to build better soil through amendments, through compost, through biochar and through broad forking, um, as opposed to something like sand, which is harder to hold on to, uh, nutrients and minerals. Uh, so, so that's our baseline that we're using. And, um, it, it has very low in nutrients levels as well. So like a lot of my brassicas are having a hard time, but they've gotten better and better. And over the course of two years, this is our first year inoculating biochar into our compost and uh, applying it to our fields. But over the course of two years after the compost amendments, we've seen dramatic differences in our growth patterns. Um, I'm very excited to see what happens in the future. Next slide, please. So, we have a lot of projects happening on our farm as well. We have the carbon sponge projects. Uh, we're experimenting with biochar. We collect compost from different businesses and uh, production studios in the area. Uh, we have a performing arts venue here. We also provide workshops and community outreach in different forms. Next slide. So I'd like to share about the carbon sponge project that we are currently working on. The carbon sponge project is very, very dear to me. Uh, this picture you're seeing here is just a small, awkward piece of rectangle, piece of land that I really didn't know what to do with. It was kind of smack dab in the middle of the field and it was just dead soil. There was no biological activity. There was nothing, not, I mean, just basically weeds growing out of it. And so I connected with a person from New York City. Her name is Brooke Singer. And it's basically a project where we are doing everything we can and learning everything we can to build soil and sequester carbon. What we do is we have a tool that we use to monitor the biological activity. Uh, it's an affordable tool. It costs about $200. And what it does is it just, we, we take samples of the soil and we take images of it. And then it, uh, it goes in through like a, a system database program or whatever. And it tells us the biological activity and how many, how much biological activity is in our soils. So it's a quick, easy, affordable way for us to monitor how much carbon is in our soil. Not only, well, I need to say that all biological life is, microbiological life is half carbon. So the more bio biology that we're building, the more carbon that we are sequestering. And what we've done is we've partnered with six other farms, five other farms, uh, we're the sixth, and um, we funded a, these testing kits and we are providing um, our knowledge and we're learning all together on ways to uh, sequester carbon. And we're teaching these farmers how to do it on their own farms. It's been a really exciting project. Uh, everyone we're working with has learned a tremendous amount and um, it's a good way again for farmers who don't have much time to do things are, can consistently and quickly monitor the soil and see the progress that they're making. So uh what we've done though is we've we've identified certain plants that are phytolithic that uh 
sequester the most carbon, that draw down the most carbon and, and maintain it in the soil. One of those plants that we uh, grow is sorghum. And sorghum is, uh, it's a beautiful plant, kind of looks like a corn stalk. But um, what happens is, is it, it, uh, it binds with silica in the soil to uh, create this, this phytolith, which is um, uh, basically like a tiny little, you can't even see it, it's microscopic, but it's just like a tiny little carbon chunk that's in the soil. And we found that sorghum is the best to do that. So we're exper experimenting with different kinds of sorghum. Uh, we're finding there are some perennial sorghums, and this is just a, a, a developing project that we're looking forward to seeing what happens in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, again, compost collection, that's one of our big things. Uh, I'm collecting from a few restaurants. Uh, we have a community compost drop-off in our at our farm stand in the front. Uh, there's a production studio that's nearby that we work with. It's called Upriver Studios. And for people who know about the production world, uh, film production world, it is heavily, heavily wasteful. They have catering businesses. They have massive construction sites. And um, I will talk about this a little bit later, but we're also, we're also partnering with them to collect all of their wood waste to turn that into biochar as well. So again, one of our ways that we're or, uh, engaging with our community. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to talk about biochar. We're also experimenting with biochar. Uh, and this is just to follow up with all of our projects. Uh, and then the next section will be more about biochar production that we're doing. So that's it. And if people have questions about our farm, this is a good time to ask. All right, great presentation, Dallas, thank you. Thank you. So before Dallas uh, presents on specifically on biochar, we'd love to get people's questions, comments, or any discussion that, uh, of thoughts that people have. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you chose the sort of different ratios of what you grow, sort of vegetables compared to orchard, you know, the amount of livestock, how you, it sounds like you think pretty holistically and you've got a diverse uh, set of factors on your landscape to consider. So how did you stitch that all together into the blend of things that you chose to grow? In terms of vegetable production, that's just something that is constantly changing throughout the season. I basically choose everything by bed length and decide how much I want to grow and how often I want to grow it. Uh, so that's a constantly changing thing. And it just takes experience and also knowing your market and where you're finding uh, your best margins. Um, so that's it really just comes down to your, to your market and like what your main sales outlets are. And also it depends on what, you know, your soils are and how your soils uh, respond to certain vegetables uh, or even not your soil, just even your, your climate or microclimate. There's a lot of different factors that go into play there. So it just takes time. And on my second year here at this farm, there's been a lot of adjustment that's happened so far because I've found out, you know, my, brassicas don't always uh, head up or it's hard to grow broccoli on this farm. So I'm going to grow a lot less of it next year until we grow better soil. But in terms of uh, orchard production, that orchard has been there for about 10 years. And uh, I am trying at the moment to redesign that orchard to grow more of uh, the productive types of things that I want to grow. And things like chickens, you know, we had way too many chickens when I got here. We were over capacity and it was not a practical amount. And so the predators told me that. And uh, since then, we've dropped our coop from our, our flock from 125 to about 40. So, uh, you know, these things just constantly change. And that's part of being a caretaker of land and farmer is just being able to adapt to the needs of the of the land and it takes time for these things to tell you and to show show you what the land needs. Um, so, you know, and it's a lifestyle too. Like I live here on the farm and it's important to constantly be able to monitor things and and see what the land tells you it needs. Thank you. Okay, Eve. 
Thank you, Dallas. What a beautiful farm. It's so exciting that you're growing so many different um, varieties of vegetables and fruits, and it's just gorgeous. Um, I had a question, and maybe you've mentioned this and I didn't fully understand it, but how do you know that sorghum is a better plant for drawing down carbon? Was that published data, or did your soil tests tell you that? And um, yeah, if you could speak a little bit more to that, I would appreciate it. There is a great question. There is published data that uh, five, that certain plants that are phytolithic uh, draw down the most carbon. And it's not so much that it's drawing down more carbon exactly, but more so that it's becoming a phytolith. And the phytolith stays in the soil. So that's why we leave the roots in the soil. Microbial life can come and go. Microbial life is half carbon, half, uh, half carbon. So the phytolith... <clears throat> stays there much longer. And that's the reason we chose that, that variety. And we are, again, we are experimenting with other ones as well. There are certain, the Land Institute is, uh, excuse me, the Land Institute is um, breeding a lot of different varieties of sorghum and we're gonna be experimenting with the varieties and, and monitoring that as well. And then we're seeing these different varieties across different farms that we plan on partnering with for the coming you know, years, indefinite future. So it's an experiment that we're going to keep trying or watching. And uh, we are going to be experimenting with different, not just sorghum, but different varieties as well. Thank you. Yep. OK, our, our friend from Triform, Camp Hill. Oh, congratulations, Dallas, on uh, your diverse farm. Um, Thank you. I'm also curious about the carbon oh. sponge and um, in particular, what do you do with the sorghum once you've grown it? Great question. Uh, we, our ambition right now, and it's too ambitious as we found out this year, is to make beer out of it. Uh, sorghum is a really interesting plant. It's a beautiful plant too, but uh, there's a few, uh, there's, that was our ambition. That's actually what started uh our expansion idea was to to grow enough sorghum to make a batch of beer. Uh, people, one of the things that the problems that we're discovering though is that it's incredibly hard to malt sorghum. It just molds too quickly. So people generally use sorghum syrup and we're trying to use malt. Uh, but at this point right now, I'm sitting on a lot of sorghum that we're still trying to figure out exactly what to do. I we What we do is we chop and drop it. So we harvest the actual sorghum grain itself and we keep that and dry it with our intention to make something out of it. Uh, we're partnering with breweries, you know, we're trying to figure out the right partner here, but it's still kind of an evolving process. Um, anyways, but we also, we do the chop and drop. So we, uh, one of the beds that I harvested just a couple of days ago, actually, we cut it all down, we chopped it all up and we're just going to lay it right on the bed and it acts as um you know, it's actually like a mulch almost and we're adding organic matter as well. So, but hopefully you'll see in the coming future that we will have a small batch of beer that will be a, ne a carbon negative beer is the goal here that we're monitoring exactly how much uh, carbon we're sequestering and maintaining in the soil and then having this carbon negative beer. There's a lot of beer companies actually right now that are, this is interesting. There's a lot of beer companies that are uh, trying to create carbon negative beers. Um, Dogfish Head Brewery partnered just recently with Patagonia, and they created what's called a, Kern, a Kernza beer. Kernza is a new grain that was also developed by the Land Institute, and that's now a carbon negative beer. So we're trying to kind of enhance that and br um, bring it to New York. And but it's it's posing to be very difficult, but we've learned a tremendous amount amount about growing this year, and I think uh, the future is pretty bright with that one. We should see a beer soon. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. So I see Dan with his hand up. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ned. And Dallas, can you talk a little bit about how you market your products? Yeah, we have an on-site. I have three outlets. I have our on-site farm stand, which is open every Saturday from nine to three. And then we have wholesale accounts that we deliver to on Thursdays. And then I have a donation. I have multiple donation outlets that I, I donate to every week. So we're a, a nonprofit farm. So we're not exactly 
going out and trying, I'm trying to sell as, and move as much vegetables as I can. But also, I, I think it's important to state that I'm not trying to uh, take up too much of the market of these other small scale farmers. Uh, I'm, we're not going to any farmers markets. We're just selling right on site because I really am not trying to compete with other small scale farms at the moment. But it's also word of mouth, you know, and I, I try to visit these restaurants and connect with the chefs. And that's my best way of, of marketing our, our product. And then I have roadside signs. You wouldn't believe how effective roadside signs are in small towns for stopping at our farm stand. Okay, very good. Why don't, uh, Dallas, why don't we re uh, continue the presentation on the biochar and then uh, that'll leave us uh, a little more time for question and answer and discussion. Okay. All right, uh, this is a part I'm excited about and I'm very happy to see people here who are so knowledgeable and working so hard in the biochar industry right now. Um, I know a couple of people here at Arthur's Point. Um, Kathleen Draper, I'm happy you're here and I'm sure there's other people here that know a lot about biochar. Uh, but I'm, I'm uh, excited to start the conversation and I hope everyone can chime in a little bit. So what is biochar? Well, to visually put it, think about what comes out of your fireplace, uh, your wood burning fireplace, and that that burnt wood, that black stuff that comes out in some way or another, that's biochar. Biochar is wood matter or lignocellulosic material that is put through a pyrolysis process at very high temperatures, burning in the absence of oxygen. So wood matter is abundant among us uh, lignocellulosic matter is abundant among us wood and wood chip is everywhere there's bamboo these are just examples of major products that are used in our everyday life uh, bamboo sugar canes nutshells you know peanuts uh, walnuts acorns um, grain holes like rice holes uh, etc so it's a very abundant source and that's one of the reasons that we chose to go with it or chose to focus on it. Uh, again, it looks like what comes out of your fireplace. Uh, it burns, our machine particularly burns it at 1800 to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, basic biochar that uh, our, our goals are to get above 75% of pure carbon content with very low ash content, less than 10% ash content. So when you have your final product of biochar, it, the black stuff you see is mostly carbon and uh, the ash that's there, you can't really see it, but uh, you don't really want ash in your in your soil or your biochar because of the acidity of it. Next slide, please. So why did we choose biochar? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, we were very positioned to do this because of the proximity of my neighbor and his business. Uh, and um, our benefactor, my boss, who runs or owns this place. Um, but primarily in the United States alone, there's over 52 million tons of clean wood that is landfilled annually, every single year. So that just goes to show that that much wood that's going into the landfill shows that anyone else who's in the market of utilizing clean wood is saturated. And so there's a massive amount of room to process all this wood that's around us. That's just, I'm talking tree limbs. Um, it could be stumps, tree limbs. I'm not going to go on the list. It's a long list of things that can be used as biochar. Uh, my neighbor, particularly, the other reason is, is he runs and operates a lumber mill that has an excessive amount of wood waste and it's just piling up. He has no more room. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's a mess. And uh, this is that, that just kind of brought to light what the problem is. And then we come to learn that there's that much that's wasted every year. Uh, also, he's listed as the, the site in Socrates and Woodstock to drop off municipal as a municipal service to drop off wood waste. So it's continuing to pile up and we had to figure out something to do. Our situation was very unique where we were extremely lucky to acquire this machine called the Carbonator 6050 from Tiger Cat. Um, it's a giant machine that looks kind of like a, a shipping container with an open top. 
and that's the machine as you see there in the picture of the photo that's the machine and we load it from the top and the biochar comes out the back uh so next slide please so a lot of questions i get from people are why isn't it bad that you're burning the biochar isn't it adding uh particulate matter into our atmosphere isn't it um uh you know people just don't think that burning wood is a good idea because they think of forest fires or they think of destruction of of communities from forest fires uh believe me i'm from california i've seen all the fires and i've witness people's homes getting burned down and so i get why people are hesitant to think that burning wood is a good idea to mitigate climate change and sequester carbon or pixate carbon but real what's happening is is when we create biochar we're stabilizing carbon we're fixating and stabilizing carbon and we're removing it from the atmosphere so when a tree falls down in the woods it takes five, 20 years, sometimes for a log to fully decompose, 50 years to even to fully de decompose, go back into the soil, and then back up into the atmosphere, and then back into the tree and then back into the ground. And it's it's in a constant cycle, a carbon cycle. And so what we're doing is, is we're taking that out of that cycle and fixating it. And the important part is that we're holding on to it for an extended amount of time. So if you think about all the the carbon negative things you know one of the big problems is that a lot of people don't know how long that carbon uh the the carbon negative aspect is going to last and if we're going to do everything we can to save our climate uh we need to fixate and hold on to that carbon for at least 50 years in order to actually make an effective um, measurable difference so that's the answer to um why it's better to not just let a tree fall and die in the woods and just let it happen naturally. I mean, that happens all the time, but we're positioned again to take as much of that and make a fixated carbon material out of it. Next slide, please. So in terms of another reason we use biochar is because in terms of using it in an agricultural sense or a soil additive, it's got dramatic effects to soil so if you look at car uh, biochar under a microscope you what you really th need to think of it as is uh if you look at it under a microscope you're going to see thousands of thousands of small little pockets and holes and just a lot of tiny little places and the way it was simply put to me that makes the most sense is biochar is essentially a hotel for millions of microbes so all as i said earlier when we're building car storing carbon into the ground through a micro microbial sense all uh microbial life is half carbon so the biochar is carbon itself it's also a house for carbon or for microbes and it it increases the biodiversity and uh, the biodiversity in the soil then increases microbial life and continues to have an active carbon rich soil it also with all of those components, it, uh, oh, sorry about that. With all those components, it uh, helps reduce soil compaction, improves plant production by adding microbial life and creating more nutrients, uh, decreases nutrient leaching by holding on to um, the nutrients and uh, absorbing more water, uh, it improves cation exchange, which is basically a uh, electric think of it as like electricity moving through things uh or atoms um and it promotes growth of mycorrhizal fungi which is uh, a, a you know a catalyst to a network for the soil basically and also sequesters carbon or a co2 carbon dioxide next slide please this is a long list and there are many hundreds of other uses for biochar as well. Uh, if everyone just wants to take a close look and if you have any questions, you can ask about them later, but there's a lot of, as some of you know in this in this uh, webinar, that there are a lot of things happening in the biochar world right now and it's so hard to keep up. Um, there's a lot of studying and uh, research happening. There's a lot of material scientists that are creating things. Uh, people are creating rubbers people are creating all kinds of polymers uh, people are using biochar for 
massive filtration um, projects. And like there's a lot of people in the Gulf who are trying to uh, experiment with biochar to filter out certain waterways. Um, there, you can use it for insulation of homes. You can use it for um, endless, endless landscape things. You can use it for art. I have this, this photo here is, you know, I just got silly one night and made a little pace and just kind of rubbed it around and called it art. But that's, you know, you can do a lot with biochar. Uh, my neighbor, Mike, or my business partner, Mike Roth, he's added it to his paints and he's painted some walls with it. So there's just endless uses and it's just now experimenting. So use your creative imagination and, and find your way with it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture that I'd like to show of different grades of biochar. So what you see on the left here is something I put through a coffee grinder. Um, on the right is exactly what's being spit out of the machine and kind of the general uh, size of most biochar. Uh, I've even, it's very brittle and I've even driven over it with our golf cart and crushed it that way. And there's all kinds of different ways to make different grades of the biochar, but this is just to show its versatility. Next slide. How we're using biochar? Well, at this moment, like I said, I've only been messing with biochar for over a year now. We're still in a lot of experimental stages. I'm consulting with a lot of people. I am, uh, I'm learning a lot about it through online resources. Uh, the International Biochar Initiative, uh, Kathleen Draper is here. Thank you very much for all the work you do to put it all together. Uh, I've learned a lot from those newsletters. Um, so we are experimenting with it on the farm and the most I've done so far has been, uh, inoculating it with compost tea that I purchased from a compost tea person in New Paltz from Hudson soil company. And, uh, the other way is that we are co-composting. So I have all types of organic matter and crop residue that is produced from the farm naturally. And we would just normally compost that through windrows or through static piles, and what I'm doing now is uh, with fresh with fresh compost, we are um, adding biochar to it, and it's co-composting. So our the bio biological activity is through the roof in the beginning stages of a compost pile, and that's so much biological activity that it's enough to inoculate all of the biochar. And so that's how we've been using it. Um, to those who don't know about it really uh do not just add biochar to your garden bed on the top uh, raw biochar will deplete it of nutrients and it'll be hard for anything to grow i've made that mistake before um we are also using it for uh chicken coops like i put it in all my chicken coops to help absorb some of the, the ammonia and just different odors that come out of it and then when it comes time to clean the chicken coop i have biochar and straw and chicken manure already all mixed up together that goes into our compost. So it's just like a, a constant thing where you can just add it to, to something and then reuse it for another thing. Um, my neighbor, Mike, uses it for his cow and horse manure piles. He just puts it on the piles and then he scoops it up and then he puts it into his compost. We're using it in the carbon sponge. Uh, I have quadrants, so I'm testing it in two different quadrant, two of the four quadrants. Um, and then artwork. <laughs> We're making paint out of it. We've made this little paste that I just messed around with. Uh, there's lots of uses, but that's how we're using it on the farm. So that's the most of it. And I'm excited to open up for questions. All right, great presentation, very exciting. Dallas, thank you. We, we do have a question um, about, um, uh, if you could clarify if wood wood burnt in a, a wood stove results in biochar, or is that a Nash product that should not be applied to soil? The latter. It is a Nash product that should not be applied to soil. You can apply it, but I would not I would not put it into my soil. I mean, if you did it once in a very small area with a very small amount, um, sure, you're probably not going to have much problems, but it needs to be inoculated first. Otherwise, uh, it's raw biochar will then be um, sucking out all that nutrients. And so that's why, again, when I said co-composting is important because, uh, you're capturing that moment when the biological activity is at its highest 
and allowing it to um, inoculate into the biochar. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Kathleen. Hi, Dallas. Thank you. That was really um, impressive for somebody who's only been uh, in the world of biochar for a year. So nice job. Um, I'm curious how much you're making on an annual basis. Is this a daily thing or is it weather dependent or when you have the feedstock? The feedstock is endless, uh, quite literally. And uh, we have been experimenting using the machine. It's a very tricky machine that requires heavy duty machinery. Yeah. At this moment though, we're sitting on about 200 plus yards of biochar. Uh, we are very particular about when we run the machine because of the fire hazards. Uh, there are, you know, there's especially, we didn't run it all summer because it was a drought and it was just too dangerous. Um, every time we run it, we call the fire marshal and let them know. Um, but we, uh, this cold season, we're planning on running it a lot. We're actually considering doing it on like a 24 hour basis, like in shifts, because it just takes a lot to, to keep it going and to get it started. Um, so we're thinking about doing that. Uh, but yeah, this last year has been just us learning how to utilize the machine. There's certain ways that when we load it, uh, it, it burns at certain temperatures and we can set the, uh, the airflow to be at higher or lower speeds um, to produce a different product. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to get our carbon content higher and higher. And it's not as good as we want it right now. We're at like 70%. And I want to get it much higher. Uh, but that's where we're at for right now. 200 yards. <laughs> cool. And we run it on rainy days, mostly too, or day after it rained. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Okay, mm -hmm. just moving across my screen. Uh, Megan is next. Hi. Oh, sorry, there's a lag. Sorry. Hi, Dallas. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I had a few questions, but I, I was wondering first, um, are you selling it? Or are you thinking about selling it once you get to um, a certain level of carbon content? Um, that was one of my, my first question. My second was, um, you know, is there anything else um, that you're measuring the quality by and in addition to carbon content? Um, not really. I think carbon content is one of the more important factors uh, and ash content as well. So those are the two things that I'm looking at the most. Uh, and also I can't because our feedstock is so mixed and diverse, I can't really have too much control over what we put into the machine. So uh, I'm, re I'm really just looking at carbon content right now. That's my main focus is highest carbon content and lowest ash content. The other part of the question, sales, we, I, I am not as confident as I'd like to be in the final products, but it's getting better. Uh, we still, we intend to sell a compost at some point because Mike Roth, my neighbor as well. He has a compost production. I'm not satisfied with his compost, um, but I think we're getting better at it. And as we start co-composting with it, it's going to get better. So I've sold a few, we've sold a few buckets for, you know, 20 bucks or whatever to like people who want to experiment with it on their home, on their own home or on their own gardens. We've made some composts that are just, you know, <clears throat> not, I'm not going to say they're official. We're just experimenting. So we haven't gotten there yet, but I, my plan is to work with people that know what they're doing here and just learn together because we have this abundant source and we can create a lot of biochar. So I want to flood the market, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to flood the market with it as much as I can and give people opportunities to experiment themselves and to um, to find new ways to utilize it. And surprisingly, I'm finding a lot of people in this area already know about biochar and are very eager to experiment in their own ways and learn more about it. So I plan to sell it in the future, but we're just not there yet. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dan, I think you're next. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ned. Um, Dallas, I was talking to Ned about this, um, I guess last week but i wonder are there any sort of very scalable operations because i'm thinking about 
the death of the ash tree in the Northeast um, and the amount of um, lumber that is going to be available and is going to be resting in the forest fairly soon. Um, I know I already, I believe, have a thousand trees that are dead. Is there any way of working with that problem in terms of bringing it to the, the biochar market? One of the problems with that, and our machine is particularly specialized to go to very uh, far off mountainous places. So the machine is on track, so it's made to go pretty much anywhere. One of the problems though, is that all of the amount of energy and uh, carbon emissions that come out of the machinery and tools and materials necessary to extract that from its source. So that 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 kind of counterbalances some things or the amount of energy that it takes. So as I said earlier in the in the presentation, 52 million tons are produced that are just that just from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, building homes, cutting down trees in our backyards or um, demolition of a building or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's endless. Uh, so it's more, you know, if you can find a way to get that deadwood to a carbonator type machine, then absolutely. Um, but it, it's just, it's more of a logistical issue and addressing and instead addressing what's currently in our system, uh, of, of operation of, of people just, having wood waste and nowhere to put it. If that answers your question, I hope. Okay, uh, Arthur's Point Farm. Hey guys. Hi, um, thank you, Dallas. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, my name's Dave Newman, not Arthur's Point Farm. Sorry about that, but um, I'm from Arthur's Point Farm. We make some biochar here in a retort kiln uh, called the Exeter Retort. Uh, which is a different process, which is a slower pyrolysis process. Um, so I was curious about the, I know you've had it tested and we talked, you talked about the carbon content, the ash content, um, but I was curious about the pH that you're getting uh, at that uh, level, at that temperature, uh, the conversion ratio of biomass in to biochar out. And um, I think just wanted to open up a, a discussion around um, the net benefits from a um, carbon sequestration standpoint um, for our Exeter retort or your machine, which doesn't have the ability to use a lot of the excess heat or uh, excess gas that it's generated through the combustion or the pyrolysis of the wood. Um, we see a, a real opportunity to scale uh, regionally with some of the waste products you're talking about, especially around the local mill, construction industry, um, to capture that heat and use it for um, process heat or for buildings. Uh, and, and in that way, that to my, in my understanding, that's really the only way that we can create a sustainable and um, uh, kind of net benefit to uh, climate uh, from being able to uh, offset fossil fuels for heat or power through a lot of the extra energy that's created in the process, whether it's the process that you're using or the one that we're using. So it's just curious about if you have any thoughts on that in terms of scalability. Um, but I was, I was specifically curious about conversion ratio and pH. If you, I don't know if you have that offhand. I'm searching it now and I'm having a hard time pulling it up. Uh, I do not have an answer to that question. Um, I will definitely look into it. Let's see here. A lot of the biochar that's on the market that's sold at, you know, you can buy it online, uh, products that are out there. A lot of it uh, in our research is coming from large biomass to energy plants mm -hmm. that are highly unsustainable uh, in terms of needing to feed in feedstock from very far away um, to support that. Uh, and just, just the amount of transport energy needed to move the, the, the feedstock. And it's also a, ca a gasification process that that uh, is a higher temperature, and it leads to typically a lower carbon content, a higher ash content, and a much higher pH. Um, yeah. 
So I was just curious if that's what you're experiencing too at those. Our pH is 8.7 at the moment is what I'm looking at here. Uh, and yeah, that's so, I mean, uh, that's not terrible. I mean, that's, you know, that's yeah, not but also to, to address though, the, you know, the, uh, the LCA, the life cycle assessment, which we're working on as well. Uh, a lot of our wood is from less than five miles away. It's all just coming from the area. And also not to mention it just, it's already there. Uh, I don't know how all of it got there. We don't know that, but the point is, is that we're still finding ways to just take what's there and fixate it and keep that process going. And uh, we're coming out with the producer of the machine is going through a process to create a very, um, a very specific and accurate LCA to find out about all the emissions that are actually coming off of it. They're actually building a small building just to encompass this machine and measure everything that's coming out of it. And hopefully we'll have those results in less than four months, I'm hoping. That's at least what I've been told. So let's connect then and answer that question. That sounds good. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Shane. Thanks, Dallas. Fascinating presentation here as well. And thanks, um, folks at Arthur's Point. That was sort of the first half of my question uh, there. Uh, the second half is... Uh, do you see this as a product that's probably that's going to primarily be beneficial or sort of economically viable for like small garden home gardeners and market garden scale? Or do you see there being a point at which it can be scaled to be applied to larger acreages? I, that, great question. I My goal is to make it so have some, an abundance of biochar available that we can just give it away practically. I mean, we want to make money, of course, but we want to make it so abundant to local compost producers so that biochar is in all compost. That's where that's what it should be, to be honest. Um, and uh, the cost of all that and the scale, I don't know, but I think we'll eventually get there. The value, I don't know, but I'm sure it's going to be high at some point. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I just missed that. I'm sorry. What was the other part of the question? Uh, oh, I, the I, big, large scale, large scale. So, uh, like, I, I mean, I imagine Bill Gates and all of his thousands of acres can somehow find a way to incorporate this. There have been experiments where people in Bakersfield, actually, in my hometown, where they did it on massive acreage, like, I don't know, I think a 100 acres or something like that. Uh, and it was a total failure because they didn't inoculate it first and they basically killed the soil. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, again, I just, that's why I think the machine that we have is so special because it can just create just a ton and, um, just get the ball rolling and just to get it out there. This machine is made to go into the woods, into deep forested woods. That's why it has the tracks and then to either take the biochar with them or just leave it there on site. You know, there's, there's all kinds of different options, but I imagine it being scaled and a more abundant tool to be utilized and also more affordable tool as well in the future. All right, very good. Well, this has been a great presentation, Dallas. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks to all who participated, asked questions, uh, added your own thoughts. Uh, so um, we'll look for ways to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, once again, uh, my final public service announcement, uh, if you're a New York voter, uh, please be sure to turn the, the ballot over on November 8th and, and vote yes um, for the Proposition 1, the Environmental Bond Act. Um, all right. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Dallas. Bye.